So good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed for this invitation. I'm of course flattered to be invited to be one of the speakers, the final speaker, I think, a very, very distinguished set of speakers um, this evening, to consider the work of Rafael Maneo. Of course, an architect, I need hardly say, whose work I admire profoundly and about whom I've written with Francisco Gonzalez de Canales, who's here this evening, and Rafael is here too. So it's very daunting to speak in the presence of him and many who know the Earth well and who have participated in Raphael's career. Uh, as the other two speakers, I will treat the work as involving the thought and writings that Raphael undertook in the period from 1990 to today, since it is, as we all know, the very essence of his practice that theoretical reflection should accompany design. Indeed, that is what distinguishes his practice from that of most of his contemporaries, I would say. And naturally, I will need to be highly selective in talking about his buildings, because uh, there were more than 100 uh, of buildings and projects in which the office was engaged from 1990 until 2013. And I will confine myself to a very few in any detail. But the theme that I want to address is that of trust. Uh, it's a philosophical theme, an ethical theme. The ethical role of the architect today who seeks to resolve the brief of his client appropriately. When an architect has achieved international recognition, as had Raphael Maneau by 1990, the commissions he received must be conditioned by that reputation, whether they are direct or as a result of being invited to be placed in a shortlist, or has been the case uh, in, in uh, a number of occasions when he's called upon to resolve a previously unsatisfactory situation. His extension to the town hall at Murthia is probably his most influential building, for better or worse. He was entrusted with an extremely difficult problem, not just to make the necessary extension space, but to invent a vocabulary for a facade that would address a very specific context. Raphael has written himself of the precedents that he had in mind, uh, principally the Sinai fronds of, uh, the, of Roman theatres as a response to the uh, retable, or you could say the rerados, within the cathedral opposite, and in dialogue with the facade of the adjacent cardinal's palace. The result is, I think, an extraordinary invention. Neither uh, an integrated frame and panel system, nor a freestanding element that screens a load-bearing frame, both of which have numerous modernist precedents, and clearly, and for many shockingly, an abstract modernist composition in itself. And as I said, this facade has sprouted numerous uh, imitations all over the world, uh, not least in London, I'm showing two of them. Uh, and, of course, what, what's happening is here, these imitations, the question raised is, should the inventive architect be responsible for the derivations of his design? In this case, I, I'm saying not, because in this case we would blame Charles Voisey for every semi-detached house in England, provided, provided the model... Uh, does not inevitably pretend to promote results that are themselves irresponsible, we can hardly do so. We can hardly make that blame, however distressing they are aesthetically. As is so frequently the case, it's not the thoroughly considered process of choosing appropriate models as the stimulus for formal invention that is imitated, but merely the resulting forms, particularly, I would say, in England. I'm struggling to find, as you will see, good responses to Raphael's work in my country. At the Prado Museum, as you will be aware, Raphael Monet was entrusted with the task of refashioning Spain's most well-known gallery and one of the largest in Europe. I'm aware that the appointment was as political as that at Murcia, following two competitions. That he was entrusted, I come back to that word, entrusted with this commission, must place a burden of responsibility on any architect. Should he deliver a masterpiece to represent his own personality? and its manifestation in this challenging context. The resulting solution, to my mind, shows a commendable modesty, 
in that following a careful analysis of the development of the museum over time, it concentrates on resolving the complex circulation patterns of the existing gallery while suppressing the external expression of the new additions. A similar modesty is apparent in the Stockholm Modern Art Museum. It's a very large building that is structured in such a way as to defer both to its landscape setting on the island of Skepsholmen and to the adjacent buildings. The internal exhibition spaces provide a series of carefully judged volumes, specifically fashioned for the permanent display, but with generalized space for temporary exhibition lying off a simple linear gallery. Without the drama of the Aubrey Jones Beck Museum in Houston, which has a subtle compacted plan with several roof-lit inter penetrations between floors, this clear arrangement can make for a satisfying, coherent gallery experience. But it also requires careful curating in ensuring the character of the different spaces uh, that, that are respected. The British-born senior curator of contemporary architecture in London's Victoria and Albert Museum, Kieran Long, has just been appointed as director of the Swedish Centre for Architecture and Design, which occupies the adjacent building part of it. And I'm hoping he will be able to ensure the building as a whole is used in the way it was always planned to be. Indeed, I will be actively encouraging him in this direction. But my theme is modesty. To judge how modestly both the Prado Extension and the Stockholm Museum express themselves, we only have to glance at museum projects by other architects carried out at more or less the same time. Raphael's restraint is entirely deliberate, and it is a tribute to the good judgment of the juries in both Stockholm and Houston that they recognize this quality and were prepared to adopt it rather than seek an iconic monument. Entrusted by the town of Don Benito to design their cultural center, which I see is not in the exhibition downstairs, but it's a favorite of mine. It's a smaller, um, less prominent commission. But Raphael Moneo took the opportunity here, I think, to create a tour de force that recapitulates a number of formal themes that had preoccupied him over the years. The simple rendered building steps up at the corner to acknowledge the adjacent town square has a cluster of roof lights on which storks are prone to make nests. Internally, the motif that strikes one particularly is the use of Sonian domes in the library, which receive daylight penetrating through the gallery floor above. Raphael had used these shallow domes before, perhaps most prominently for the car park at the Atocha railway station, where the circular roof lights act as a ventilator, an altogether more shocking appropriation of Soane's famous breakfast room ceiling than their employment at Don Benito. But Raphael Moneo has been consistent in arguing that forms can be taken in this way from multiple sources and given new meanings. Arguably, Soane's secularization of the Pantheon, which is one way of seeing his own invention, was even more adventurous but then I think of Domus Aurea. Here, I think, in, in Raphael's building, there is an element of playfulness, a display of architectural skill, but also a refashioning that adds to the sets of associations that this motif can evo evoke, and reminds me personally of the subtle daring which Soane himself employed at Wimpole near Cambridge in inserting a new sitting room, adding a book room to the pre-existing library, and inventing an internal plunge pool, which of course has classical precedence. Surely it is legitimate for an architect at the peak of his abilities to play in this way. The trust invested in Raphael Moneo by Colonel Mahoney and his colleagues to design the Cathedral of Our Lady in Los Angeles was of a different order. He was required to symbolize a faith in which he'd been educated, which has lost its universal authority to become a more personal matter. Raphael Moneo was clear that in a commission such as this, society is actually asking the architect to take the risk of offering his vision of what constitutes a sacred space. Raphael achieved his aim partly by traditional means, the handling of light and the use of symbolism, and partly by an unusual arrangement whereby access to the nave is from the east, past the sacred apse, thereby reversing the normal approach. 
This, as you may be well aware, is a formal arrangement that he's encountered, that he had encountered already in a secular context as a young assistant to Jorn Utzen working on the Sydney Opera House and has himself exploited on a number of occasions. A sacred precedent, I believe, is the remarkable Benedictine church of Las Condes, Santiago, Chile, by Gabriel Guada and Martin Correa. But I want to turn now to the vexed question raised by this debate. How do we assess this work now? Does it have relevance for the 21st century? As a superficial indication of the state of architecture during this period, we could look at something like Wikipedia entries year by year. This is the English version of Wikipedia of what are deemed to be important buildings. Between 1990 and 2017, only one building by Raphael Moneo has been noticed, uh, which was the moment when the consecration of Los Angeles Cathedral took place. Although the awards he received, 1996 UIA Medal, Pritzker Prize, 2001 Mies van der Rohe Prize, were for duly recorded. It has to be admitted that many of those that are listed or illustrated here are of mixed architectural quality. And this is principally for their iconic, not to say phallic, characteristics. Let's take another example. The international competition for the new Guggenheim Museum in Helsinki, organized by an English firm, Malcolm Reading Associates. It attracted 1,715 entries. Looking at those on a website was truly dispiriting. The winning scheme uh, on the right there was one of the least flamboyantly inappropriate but I am personally relieved that it will not be built. To my own mind, it shared with nearly all the other proposals a demonstrable failure to understand and respond to the dignity and coherence of the harbour setting to which the 20th century architects Villa Ravel and Alvar Alto had each contributed in an exemplary way. Did any of these competition entries begin to repay the duty they owed to the city? Were there architects to be entrusted with such a commission? Did the participants in that competition consider the galleries that Raphael Moneo had built in the recent decades? What we are seeing today is surely an extreme form of a dichotomy that has been evident for a number of years. On the one hand, the most reductive solution at the cheapest cost for the mass of buildings, maximizing measurable efficiencies, ignoring any other criteria. On the other, iconic structures where it matters little how well the building functions, whether as town hall, art gallery, or concert hall, provided it supplies an image that can boost tourist revenue or flatter personal or civic identity. Both aspects are made possible and exacerbated by the continuing advance of QPG techniques, of course. A thoughtful, reflective architecture is hard to find. But the situation, I hope, not entirely without hope. My own experience of teaching a younger generation leads me to believe that Raphael's buildings and the thinking that lie behind them will be the focus of increasing study in the years to come. It was probably the case already in the 1990s that the students of that period were more directly influenced by Raphael's teaching at Harvard than by his buildings, which they may or may not have taken any trouble to visit. In my own practice, I would like to believe that we've learned something from Raphael Moneo, but more relevantly, I illustrate the work of two British former students of mine who were each part of a studio which Fernando Perez and I taught. We visited Cursal in San Sebastian and then went on to Madrid to meet Rafael. Both of these students are now partners in successful practices, engaging in new buildings and working in challenging historic contexts. There is certainly much to learn from the writings. I like to draw my students' attention to Raphael's meditation in 2010, looking back, of course, uh, on his own Euromare building in San Sebastian of many years earlier. A meditation of the two attitudes one might take to the question of typology, which, of course, had preoccupied him in those opposition articles. And one of the clearest statements I know of how a philosophical framework, whether acknowledged or not, conditions the way we design. So the notion of type, I quote here, I think it's worth reading this, implies the recognition of common features that allow us to identify those works of architecture that share the same formal structure, leading us again to the age-old question of universality. The side one chooses to be on, Plato versus Aristotle, 
is crucial in defining the concept of type. Well, for Platonists, I would put someone like Rossi in that position, a type is the eternal representation of the original idea, regardless of specific examples. For Aristotelians, and perhaps Raphael is one of those, I'm wondering, he doesn't say so, it is the common denominator that can be perceived through the careful observation of a series of works that maintain the principle of continuity through which history unfolds. These two approaches lead to clearly differentiated theories in architecture. Since Raphael's own position is illustrated in his writing and teaching, as well as in the projects from his own office, it was part of the purpose of the book that Francisco, Francisco and I published to try and summarize that without, we must hope, doing the subtlety of his position an injustice. In response to the position, to the architectural conditions we find ourselves in today, his message seems to me to be all the more relevant. And it's a position that at root is philosophical, indeed ethical, how the architect should repay the trust which his position entails. Gratuitous formal invention without a sense of architectural precedent and context, however seductive, should be avoided. While architects have a moral duty to understand their culture, they can be permitted to choose freely from it, and acts of invention are possible within and sometimes challenging the conventions that have been inherited. Most importantly, just as practice has to be combined with informed reflectiveness, so theory has to be tested in the actuality of building. These projects and many others that I could have illustrated, responding so skillfully to the briefs to which he was entrusted, are testament to Raphael Maneo's enduring importance. Thank you. <laughs>